Please remain standing for the reading from God's word this morning. From 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's God's word for his people today. You may be seated. And let's pray once again as we look into the empty tomb and all that is ours because of it. And so, Father, we ask that your praises would be on our hearts and lips, that you would give us eyes to see your great mercy what you have done in it and causing us to be born again. Give us hands that are able to grip this living hope that we have because Jesus Christ is risen. And guard us by this faith you give. Grow it for those who have it. Give it to those who don't. And we pray that you would keep us until that last day when we receive our inheritance and see our Savior face to face. And then we pray that you would send us out proclaiming forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus to our neighbors and the nations so that the glory of our Savior would cover this earth as the waters cover the sea. Do what we pray for the glory of your great name. Amen. Born again. Now, depending on what's going on or the context you hear that in, it's a pretty loaded term these days, isn't it? When you hear born again, what comes to mind? Maybe it's a Bible thumper with fundamentalist tendencies. Maybe a person with lots of grace for themselves and their kind of sin, but not a lot of grace for people with different kind of sins than theirs. Maybe it's a person who likes to boycott, but only does it for the things that are liberal. Maybe it's a voting block and one that always votes conservative. What do all those things have in common? Well, each one has to do with something a person does, something they do, a way they think or a way they act. And then it's a, a label upon those things. Now, searching born again in Google gives over 1.2 billion results in 0.94 seconds. And one of which is WikiHow's article with pictures, by the way, cartoon pictures, and it begins like this. Being born again means giving up your old life to live a new life through Jesus Christ. If you want to be born again, start by becoming a Christian, and then live your life for Jesus as best you can. Finally, you can grow your faith by attending church, reading the Bible, and praying. Now, this was just updated on March 4th, so... This is one of the top results on that first page you get in Google. Born again just means you give up your old ways. You choose to become a Christian. Then you've got to live the life you, as best as you can for Jesus. And then you do churchy things that born again type people do. All right? So it's, it's not really a new life as much as it's life done in a new way. Just like you get tired of your hairstyle. So you got a new one, which was pretty funny if you're watching the basketball game last night. They showed this, like, a, a cartoon given thanks to first responders, and some of those first responders were hairstylists, and they showed just people with wacko hair from the last year in lockdown, right? <laughs> so it's just like, well, it's a new year. I need something new. I don't want to ever go through that again. New style, right? Or new fashion clothes. It's just choosing something different. That's what born again means. You're just trying your best as you aim for new goals, just different goals. You're doing church things because your old way of life wasn't working out. And why is that attractive? Because well, then you can choose what you like. <laughs> you can leave off what you don't like. You still have control over your life. And if this Jesus thing doesn't pan out, then you just try something else. And what's really heartbreaking is so many believe that that is Christianity. And that many people who claim to be Christians, even some who'd scoff at that WikiHow article, often have all the doctrine and the godliness, 
But as Paul condemns, they lack the power of Christ's spirit in them. They may be able to be pointing out bad doctrine, yet they live daily as if it is up to them to live as best they can. And they evaluate their identity and spirituality by how many times they sat in a service, how many times they read the Bible or didn't read it, and how many times they prayed this week. But friends, I have good news. The Bible says that's not what born again means. Amen. The Bible does use the language of new birth because when you're first born, you're born alive in this world, yet you're actually spiritually dead because by nature we're sinners. We are in sin from the moment we're conceived. And Ephesians 2 says it this way, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And walked is a metaphor for live. You know, following the course of this world. You lived following the course of this world. You followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. This is our story. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, doing whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted, with no regard for God, which means we were by nature children of wrath. That's who we are. We don't just do sinful things. We are sinners. We are sinful. And that is the story of all mankind. And so what every person needs is a rebirth. You need to be made spiritually alive. You need a spiritual birth. Jesus says in John 3, you must be born again. But think about your first birth. How much did you have to do with it? None. Nothing. Nothing. You arrived. <laughs> Other people caused it. You have no way, just like you had nothing to do with your first birth, of causing the second birth. You have no way on your own to be born again. You can't do anything to be born again, no matter what search results on Google tell you. It's all God's doing. And that's why Peter writes in verse 3, according to his, God's great mercy. He, he has caused He's done it. It's his initiative. And what did he cause? You to be born again. It's passive. He's active. We're passive. It's all God's doing. And that's one of the reasons why we celebrate on Easter. But our celebration of Easter Sunday doesn't begin with an empty tomb. Peter tells us it begins long before that. It begins with God's great mercy. And the greatness of God's mercy is detailed in three ways. So we have two main points. We're going to see the greatness of God's mercy and what that mercy gives us. So first, this greatness of God's mercy, and we see it in three ways. Look at verse 2. God's great mercy causes sinners to be born again according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, God didn't decide to be merciful on the day sin entered the world. But long before that, in eternity past, God chose he decided, he had foreknowledge before anything occurred, that he would save a people from their sin. He decided to cause people to be born again for the glory of his name. And only because of his foreknowledge. Only because he sovereignly chose to. That's mercy. So foreknowledge means God chose to cause dead sinners to be born again, not because of anything in them. He didn't foresee them doing something that would earn it. So we didn't earn it or get this new birth because of anything in us or that we ever could or would do. It's all mercy. It's according to his great mercy. And mercy is being given something you don't deserve. So this foreknowledge is not based upon us, but all because God, he foreknew that he would show mercy so that people would praise it, so that you would know it and worship it and revel in it and love it. It's a God's. It's all God's. We deserve to remain dead in sin. We're by nature children of wrath. But God, according to his great mercy, decided to cause his people to be born again. And that's the first way we see this mercy. It has nothing to do with us. It's, it's all God. And then verse 2 said, Secondly, God's great mercy is seen in its coming to sinners in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And again, we got another fancy Bible word, sanctification. It just means to be made holy, to be set apart. And often in the Bible, 
Sanctification is this lifelong process. After God saves his people, we, er, we enter this process of sanctification, of becoming more and more like Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit. But here, the holiness in view here is tied in the context to God saving a people. So sanctification relates to God's great mercy in causing us to be born again. Which means the holiness in view here is God the Spirit takes these dead sinners who are dead to sin and by nature deserving of eternal wrath, he cleans, he removes the stain of sin. That's what the Spirit does. It has nothing to do with you. You didn't do anything. God chose, and then he sends the Spirit to remove the stain of sin from us, to cause us to come to life. But what can wash away our sin? We sang about it on Friday. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so the third way God's great mercy is seen in verse 2 is for obedience to Jesus Christ, which means, just again, that process of becoming more like Him, Him as Lord and Savior, living for Him, and His glory becomes central to our lives. But look at this last phrase, and for sprinkling with His blood. How great is God's mercy? He sent His own Son. Instead of giving what his people deserve to stay dead in our sins, God sent his son to be born a man in order to live perfectly according to God's law, holy, so that he could stand in our place as the holy lamb to bear our sin in the judgment that sin demands, which is death. And so Jesus shed his blood and sprinkled his people with it through the power of the Holy Spirit, all because of God's great mercy to redeem us from death. So what do we see over and over here about God's mercy? About being born again? What's the Bible say about being born again? There's absolutely nothing you can do to be born again. It's done to you. It's mercy and grace. It's His great mercy through the work of the Spirit and Jesus' death on the cross. And so we should worship, be in awe of mercy, which did not leave his people in the grave, but caused us to rise and be made alive in Jesus Christ. But, though there's nothing you can do to be born again, being born again changes everything you do. You, you, just as you didn't come into the world because of anything you did, as soon as you did come in the world, what'd you start doing? Maybe after they cleared out your throat and spanked you. You start screaming and crying. You start doing things. And just like that, with this rebirth, you can't do anything to cause it. But as soon as it's caused in you, everything about you and everything you do changes. All right? And so, you've got to keep that in mind. But, but let's see. Let's see the three ways. So we see God's great mercy in three ways. And what's his great mercy do? What's it cause? This born again, it gives us three things. We'll look at these three things with the last of our time. So three ways. First, being born again gives you a living hope. Gives you a living hope. Look at verse 3. According to God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So it's mercy that he gives you something, and what he gives is a living hope. You've heard the phrase, hoping against all hope. Hoping against all hope. You probably just did it, right? That's what we Michiganders do every March. When those 70 degree days come, we start dancing around saying, hope, is, hope, spring is here. And then what happens the first day of April? A snowstorm where you can't even see the cars in front of you on I-75. And then sunshine, and then flurries again. It just keeps coming. It does it every year, right? And if it's not weather, it's something else. There are things this world holds out to us that, that tempt us to put our hope in them, and they are dead and fading. <laughs> and all, uh, and we all do it, right? We, we all put our hope in these things or are tempted to, even though nothing in the past gives us any reason to hope for a different outcome this time. But yet we keep going back to them. This time's going to be different. Or this thing's brand new. Or this is the new model. Or this is the new way. Or there's these new laws. Or there's these new this. Or these new that. But yet they continue to be dead and fail. 
But when God causes you to be born again, what's he say? He causes you to be born again, not just to a new hope, not even to a different kind of hope, but to a living hope. God gives those he causes to be born again a vibrant, a, a real hope that permeates, that changes everything about us. It influences all areas of our life. It permeates our daily living. So think about it this way. When you watch the news, right, many people are hoping for a particular outcome. Not always bad, but we're hoping for a particular outcomes. Or we're hoping for this person to be elected, or this stimulus bill to be passed, or these laws to go into effect, or for this money to come, or for the stock market to rise. We're hoping for this person to call me, or for that person to like me, or to my, my, my fame or my business to grow, or for these securities to come in in these ways. And we sit on pins and needles with knots in our stomachs waiting the outcome. That's hoping in dead things because you don't know. But verse 3 says those who have been born again have been given a living hope, one that imparts confidence and peace and security and joy no matter what you face that's the difference dead hopes don't know the outcome they sit on pins and needles but a living hope doesn't matter the outcome i already know what's happened now what can do that like what possibility can override any what if you can ever think of or face look at, look at verse three god has caused us to be born again to a living hope what through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why we say he is risen. Because Jesus' resurrection means those God causes to be born again aren't people who hope against all hope. No matter what everyone all around us thinks we're doing this morning or thinks we're wasting our time. It doesn't matter what they think. We're not hoping against all hope because Jesus is alive. Now remember, Peter writes to churches going through suffering. That's why he writes this letter to them. And they're about to go through intense persecution in the coming years because of their faith in Jesus. So having a living hope doesn't mean you won't go through trials or suffering or persecution. It doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen. What's this living hope mean then? It means even if the worst things imaginable happen, Jesus being raised from the dead means you have nothing to fear. That's living hope. Now hear me again. It doesn't mean there is nothing fearful coming at you or there aren't scary things that might happen. His resurrection gives a living hope that changes the fearful what-ifs into a confident even-if. We're not a people of what-if. right? We're, we're even-if kind of people. Now all the fear of a what-if this happens evaporates when you bring it to an empty tomb, right? Well, what if this happens? Well, even if Jesus is alive. Now, I can't do them for the thousands of what-ifs you might be thinking or going through right now. But every what-if is turned into an ever, even if when it's brought to the empty tomb. It doesn't mean there's nothing to fear. But when that fear is brought before the fact that Jesus is alive, your fears lose their power. Because no what-if can put Jesus back in the grave. No what if can reverse the resurrection. So you can think up worst case scenarios, and some of you are very good at this. Some of you are professional worst case scenario people. And you can think up worst case scenarios every day for your entire life, but you will never come up with one where God will say, whew, I didn't think of that one. Oh, I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see how it all plays out. No, that's dead hope. But we have a living hope. Jesus is alive. You can't put him back in. No enemy can put him back in. And so his resurrection means those who are born again have a joyful confidence. So it's not stoicism. It's not, it's, it's not uh, ignoring that bad things happen. It's not even say there's nothing to fear. The Bible never says there's nothing to fear. Even when it tells you to fear not, there's a reason. Because Jesus is here. Jesus is alive. God is sovereign. It's not that there's not nothing to fear. It's that he's bigger than them. 
All right? And so it infuses every day with hope. And a living hope that changes your what ifs into even ifs. That's living hope. Now, what is the what if? Now, I can't go through them all. It would be a fun exercise, too. And if you need help, we'll do it. <laughs> right? Not right now, but we'll do it after the service. But what, what can you answer the even if? What, what is the sure confidence of the even if? What grounds it? What's our answer no matter what if we face? It's a sure inheritance. It's the second thing. All right, so we've been born again. His great mercy gives us living hope. And then secondly, it guarantees our inheritance. It guarantees our inheritance. We watched um, a documentary uh, just recently on the college admissions scandal uh, where people bought their kids' athletic scholarships at the universities they wanted to attend, even though the kids never played the sport. Right? So they would Photoshop their kids' faces or take terrible pictures and say, they like to ride horses or row or they're great sailors, even though they never stepped foot in a boat. Right? So their parents bought them these things and they got in. And throughout the process, people, f people felt the immorality of it. One guy was even a lawyer that says, I'm a lawyer and I'm not sure about all this. But then what? It works. It's never failed. No one finds out. They just keep asking these questions over and over. It's guaranteed. And the answer is, well, in the past 20 some odd years, it's never failed. That's dead hope right there. And of course, since there's a documentary, you know people did find out. <laughs> and it doesn't work anymore. And it's not guaranteed. And now people's lives are ruined by their involvement. There is only one guarantee in this world, and that's your life will one day end in it. That's the one guarantee we have. Apart from Jesus. But when God causes you to be born again, he says it is not death to die, which is an amazing guarantee. Look at John 11. Jesus says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And so Easter celebrates Jesus' resurrection as his triumph over death. His resurrection guarantees the resurrection of whoever believes in him. Uh, uh, and whoever believes in him are those who God causes to be born again. Do you believe in Jesus? Is your faith in him? Then he's caused you to be born again. This is not a moment to, to just agonize over all the things I've done and if I'm doing it right or if I'm believing enough. No, Jesus, whoever believes in me. It's not again about you. You can't cause yourself to be born again. What has God done? And his resurrection guarantees the resurrection of any who believe in Jesus. And so the guarantee is whatever happens to you, just pales in comparison. You can't die. And even if you do die, it's not death. It's a guaranteed inheritance awaiting you. Now look at how God talks about this. Because God has caused us to be born again, verse 4, to an inheritance. That inheritance of life in Jesus it is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So when God gives you a living hope, then he guarantees you this inheritance. It's unper imperishable. <laughs> Everything in this world fades or fails, right? It breaks. You need new cars, new things, new that. But this word inheritance points to God fulfilling all his promise, including eternal life, right? So imperishable. Last fall, there was a, a TikTok video of a grandma who bought a McDonald's burger and fries in 1996. Some of you are not even, weren't even alive in 1996, which makes me feel old. I was in 10th grade in 1996. I went to McDonald's a lot in 1996. This lady got a burger and fries, forgot about it, and then realized she still had it, and a long time ago, she put it in a box in her closet. And she takes it out every once in a while to show her, grandparents, her grandkids, and you know what? It looks like she just got it from McDonald's. Some of you got fries in your car, and you're like, yeah, I got one under my seat right now. <laughs> and it looks like I just got it. Like, you find a McDonald's fry, and you're like, can I still eat this? Right? That's, that's what you think. 
at 25 years, and this burger and fry don't look a day old. It's no, no sign of perishing, right? But we know it's not imperishable because if you ate, if you did eat it, even if you reheated it, I think some harm would be done. So re- regardless of what it looks like, it's gone bad. But at some point, I don't know how long she's going to have to keep it, but at some point, that burger and fry is going to be toast. Has to be, right? But since Jesus is alive, our living hope is sure. Because no matter what it might look like, or seem like, or even on the bad days feel like, our inheritance is imperishable. You can take it out and know God is keeping it. And so it will never be defiled. Our inheritance is undefiled. It can't be marred or stained. Have you ever bought something brand new only to have it wrecked on the first day? It's your iPhone and a giant scratch on it. Or something something you wear, you know, you've been you bought a brand new dress or a shirt and all of a sudden you just drop your breakfast all over it. And we just bought a car, uh, a used minivan, and uh, they scare you into buying gap coverage, right? Because and then they do it by telling you stories of how people bought their brand new vehicle and some dude plowed into them as soon as they drove off the lot. And gap coverage covers the difference between what you just paid for it and now that it's wrecked on the side of the road, what your insurance will give you for it. They, make you, they, they, they kind of make you feel like some dude is just waiting in a huge beat-up pickup truck waiting for people <laughs> to come off the lot. They're like, he's waiting. You better buy this coverage. All right? And it happens. It does. Now, it didn't happen to us, but it does happen. I bought that gap coverage, too, which makes me upset. (laughs) But Jesus' resurrection guarantees the inheritance awaiting God's people, no matter what happens, can never be stained or wrecked. can't be taken from you. You can't come to a moment in your life and go, nope, you don't get it. It's undefiled. It's, It's unstained. It cannot be wrecked. It's as pristine as the first day God promised it. And it's unfading. It's glorious everlasting. Spring is one of my favorite seasons because everything comes back to life. Everything's coming back and you get birds chirping and the sun's out and joy just wells up, right? And I have that joy because when I look out my windows in January and I see blizzards, what do I feel? Usually not joy. I just long, right? Long for the snow to be gone. But imagine grass and flowers that remain green and in bloom through the blizzards. When the blizzards are going, you can see it. They don't fade because the blizzard can't do anything to it. It's like perpetual springtime joy all year round. Since nothing can reverse the resurrection, we have a joy just like that, an actual constant source of living hope. It's unfading. Nothing in life can destroy its beauty. Why would you put your hope or attempt to find joy in anything else but this? Especially knowing that the things of this world only continue to be ruined or fade and fail. And it won't. These things are true and sure because this inheritance is kept in heaven, which means it's just in God's very presence. God's inheritance that he's keeping is so close to him, it's out of reach of every enemy, and no disaster can overtake it. Nothing can change it. Nothing can diminish it. So why put your hope in dead, uncertain things that never satisfy? You would never do this with your own money. So why would you do it with your soul, your hope, your life? Why spend your life for fleeting things that perish and fade? And brothers and sisters, when trials and suffering do come, don't let them rob you of joy. Don't let them rob God of your worship. It's a moment to stand in daily life when it really matters, and say, what I said in this room on Easter Sunday is actually true. I believe Jesus is alive. He is risen, no matter what happens. And I know the loss of earthly things are going to be difficult and hard, very bitter at times, sorrowful. The Bible doesn't uh, just kind of, yeah, thank you. You want to come up here? The Bible just doesn't, like, just doesn't like wipe those things away and say, oh, none of that matters. It just kind of walks over it. No. 
But don't let them stop you from setting your hope in a living Savior. And that's when we give him glory. That's how he gives, gets great glory for his name. When this hope that is within us, and other people go, you're going through all this, how do you have hope? And then the Spirit gives you the answer to the hope that is within you, this living hope. And this living hope that we've been born again to not only guarantees a glorious inheritance, but finally, being born again means regarded forever by God. Regarded forever by God. Look at verse 5. So those who've been born again, who have this sure inheritance, it's being kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now I wonder if you think, you, you ask yourself, why is verse 5 here? Why, why is verse 5 here? Well, stories like this reminded me of why verse 5 is here. Van Gogh is one of my favorite artists. All right? and, and some couple in Norway bought a house and found a Van Gogh secure and safe in the attic. And then they turned around and sold it for $40 million. So the people before who owned that, their kids did not get that inheritance. <laughs> How do you forget? Well, it's a story they didn't really forget. Thought it was, anyways, you can go look it up online. It's amazing. But they didn't get it. They didn't receive it. So that's why verse 5 is here. What good is your inheritance if it's kept safe in heaven if you're not safe and secure to receive it? What good is an inheritance if we aren't safe? Right? Verse 5 says, Those who God causes to be born again are being guarded through faith until the day... God fulfills all his promises till that day of salvation. He guards his people through faith. So again, you might be asking yourself, how do I know if I've been born again? It's faith. Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? That he is the son of the living God, come to be our savior, risen again and reigning on high. Faith. God doesn't just cause people to be born again and then leaves. He guards them through faith. And faith is trusting God. And verse 5 emphasizes the continual nature of faith. You are being guarded as you continue to have faith. So again, like I said, you don't do anything to be born again, but being born again changes everything you do. You, you have faith, and you have it continually. It's a daily trusting in who God is and all he's promised to do. And what is this faith grounded in? It's not just a, well, just this ethereal faith, and I kind of believe, and who, no, it's a faith grounded in the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Is Jesus risen? You might have said it all with us before, but do you believe it? That he is risen indeed. But again, that doesn't mean faith begins with you, or that you save yourself and keep yourself saved by faith, by works. But don't make the mistake that God's done his part now. And then it's up to you to make it into the end. You've got to keep having faith. But you can't then swing the pendulum the other way and say, well, if it's all God, it doesn't matter what I do. And you, you think, well, I don't have to live by faith, thinking faith has nothing to do with me. So we can't fall on either side. It's a living hope that Jesus Christ is alive, and God guards his people by keeping you believing that daily. To live out that confident hope when the what-ifs come. And that faith, then, doesn't begin with us. It's a gift. And we see that again in verse 5. How do you get faith? You're being guarded by God's power through faith. It's God who gives faith. And it's his power that sustains our faith. So when we walk out of here, after Easter Sunday, back into the world, what sustains our faith tomorrow? God. He gives us faith. And he guards it. He sustains it. And that's why I love uh, the line we sing in the new hymn, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Why? Because when I fear, my faith will fail. We don't sing, I gotta have faith. Or I better, I better try harder. No. When I fear, my faith will fail. What? He will hold me fast. It's his power. It's his gift. It's his sustaining work. It's his faith that he gives those he causes to be born again. And how can you trust that when you fear your faith may fail, that God is strong enough to hold us fast? 
Well, that power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power guarding us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who through his resurrection is now keeping us. He's keeping us safe until that day when God reveals his salvation. You won't come to a day where you say, sorry, someone else bought the house. You don't get it anymore. You didn't try hard enough. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't do this good enough. No, we all can't do it good enough. We all don't have enough faith. And if you live long enough, you realize, even if you think you have strong faith now, 20 years from now, you realize you didn't know what you were talking about. You continue to see the depth of your sin. But the amazing thing is that as we continue this walk with Jesus and we see how far apart we are from his actual holiness, the glory of his salvation and his cross gets bigger and bigger. And we start, we start leaving ourselves off and say, there's nothing I can do. But that's fine. I have Jesus. And he keeps us safe until that day. And so for those whose eyes to see the greatness of God's mercy, and you know your living hope of being born again to this inheritance into a guarding faith, what is the one thing that God demands? What is the response he tells us to have? Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exclamation point. Bless means praise, joy, all honor, all praise, glory, majesty, now and forevermore, because Jesus is alive. So praise God, because if he wasn't, we would be most of all to be pitied. We're wasting our time, but Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty, and so people who are born again should not be defined first and foremost, by the things they do, but by the things they've been given by this glorious God. We have a living hope that, that leads us to praise God in the good times and the bad times because this God, before you did anything, chose to save you, set, his, uh, set you apart by his spirit, sent his son to sprinkle you with his blood and then raised him to life, which crushed death to death. And this God, the Lord and Father, or the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, destroyed the power of the grave, which means he will never leave you, and he won't forsake you. And he is now guarding us for this inheritance until the day of salvation. And so, friends, that day is coming, and it can't come soon enough. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until then, we live by faith with this living hope. Jesus Christ. He is risen. Amen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. And so, Father, we praise you. What else can we do in light of these things? There's nothing left to do. Jesus did it all. There's nothing left to plan. You've planned it all. And so, all we can do is sing your praises. And we long for the grace to live out this living hope. We need your help. We need the Spirit's power to do it. We know in this life there will be many trials and tribulations, but you will never leave us nor forsake us because Jesus is alive. And so we pray that you would give us hope in him and that as we go out to this world that needs to hear the message of the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ alone, that you would cause us to have hope and that you would give us the power to live it out so that when those who ask about the hope that is within us, we would give you glory and the neighbors that we have and the nations around us might worship you with us both now and forever. We pray that you would get yourself great glory in doing these things. Amen. Let's stand.